Despite the attempt at uplift, the ending of Mildred Pierce strikes me as convenient. In one draft of the script, Mildred even killed Vita. Now, if they'd stuck with that, nobody would doubt this film's noir credentials. But Jerry Wald was angling for a hit, and a downer ending would crush any chance of that. Well, nobody was quite sure how to bring it in for a landing until Limey Plews, a prop man who worked on most of Curtiz's pictures, said, why not have the first husband waiting for her? Wow, talk about tying a bow on it. Not that the convenient ending bothers me. I find Mildred Pierce a perfect melodrama. Its contrivances and over-the-top moments are a big part of its appeal. Its immense popularity back in the 1940s and through to today speaks to the public's appreciation for melodrama. Many critics in 1945 didn't feel the same way. The film was dismissed by many reviewers as soapy and overwrought. But Joan Crawford's Oscar win ignited a second act for her, giving her power over a career she never had before. And her resulting run as the queen of Hollywood melodrama coincided with the noir movement, leading to such films as Possessed, Flamingo Road, The Damn Don't Cry, Sudden Fear, and many more. So it's intriguing, looking back, to realize that director Michael Curtiz was prepared to fire Crawford after a week of shooting. Joan was trying to maintain her glamorous image, and Curtiz was determined to dress her down, both literally and figuratively. Fortunately, Joan's professionalism was bigger than her ego. In 1949, she reteamed with Curtiz and producer Jerry Wald for Flamingo Road, an entertaining picture that didn't have the gravitas of Mildred Pierce. Much better was the reunion of Wald, Curtiz, and writer Ranald McDougall for Warner Brothers' second adaptation of Hemingway's To Have and Have Not. Retitled The Breaking Point and tailored for John Garfield, the film had more in common thematically with Mildred Pierce than you might imagine. Check it out for yourself when we present the 1950 film later this year on Noir Alley. And with the Sea Wolf, Yankee Doodle Dandy, Casablanca, Mildred Pierce, and The Breaking Point, all to his credit in the 1940s, Michael Curtiz could make a fair claim to being not only the best director at Warner Brothers during the decade, but the best in Hollywood. And lastly, let's pay tribute to Anne Blythe. Being able to carry your own water at 17 years of age, working with tough, seasoned pros like Curtiz and Crawford, is frankly extraordinary. She makes Vita one of the most memorable villains in the movies. And you can't say that of too many teenagers. Several years ago, I had the privilege of interviewing Anne at a screening of Mildred Pierce, and I witnessed firsthand just how professional she was. The event included a half dozen transvestites, all dressed as Joan Crawford, engaged in a pie-eating contest. Anne was amused and unflappable, and she expressed nothing but fondness and respect for Crawford, despite all the derision the star had heaped on her during the intervening years. Anne always appreciated that when she did her screen test for Curtiz, Crawford performed it with her a privilege most stars would never grant to a newcomer. You are, as always, welcome to share your opinions and observations with us on the Noir Alley Facebook page and Twitter feed. Next week, I'll be presenting a late-period noir by one of my favorite filmmakers, Samuel Fuller. It's a racially charged thriller from 1959 called The Crimson Kimono. I hope you'll join me for that one. Now, happy Mother's Day, everybody. I think you should celebrate with a fresh-baked pie. That's what I need right now. See you next week.